So welcome to our August uh, monthly meeting of the Committee on Increasing Diversity in the U.S. Ocean Studies Community. Um, today is as part of a series of monthly meetings um, where we aim to chip away at the committee's information gathering needs um, between our larger two-day uh, committee meetings. My name is Kelly Oskvig. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a senior program officer for the Ocean Studies Board at the National Academies, and I'm also the study director for um, this increasing diversity study. Uh, today, we'll hear from the committee who authored the recent report, uh, Ocean Acoustics, Education and Expertise, and learn from some of their findings and conclusions um, in that study that directly relate to increasing diversity, equity, and inclusion in ocean studies broadly. Um, and then following that report briefing and Q&A, we'll hear about some of the successes minorities in shark science have had in diversifying the ocean studies workforce. Um, but before we dig in, um, I do have just a few quick slides to talk through. Um, next slide, please. So first established um, by President Lincoln, the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, uh, referred to as NASM, are nonprofit organizations with a mission to provide evidence-based, unbiased advice on matters of scientific importance to the nation. NASM produces more than 200 reports a year annually, as well as completes a number of other types of convening activities. Um, to do this, we call on over 6,000 volunteer experts each year. Um, the work is generally funded by the government. Um, some of our work is legislatively mandated. Uh, some are commissioned by an agency, and some, like this one, are developed from the ground up um, from our wonderful Ocean Studies Board members. Um, we also work for nonprofit institutions and industry or any organization looking for objective, independent advice. Um, next slide, please. As we have a few quick but very important notes on engagement in today's session. Uh, the National Academies are committed to the principles of diversity, integrity, civility, and respect in all of our activities. And we look to you to be a partner in this commitment by helping us to maintain a professional and cordial environment. Um, as a committee, we're committed to creating a safe, inclusive space that fosters belonging. Um, we understand that we might not always get this right, um, but we are committed to improving and learning on how to best conduct inclusive meetings, um, and we welcome your feedback and suggestions. If there is something that we can do right now uh, to make this meeting more inclusive for you, please send me a note in the chat. Um, and then just for today, I'd like to, to ask you all to you know, please introduce yourself uh, the first time you talk with name and affiliation. Um, please meet yourself when you're not talking. And if you have a question, just use the raise hand uh, function and we will ask them in the order of hands raised. Um, next slide, please. So, quick project overview is this is a 24 month consensus study. Um, consensus study means it's authored by the full committee um, and everything in the report is agreed to um, by that, that committee. Um, the sponsors are the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, the Office of Naval Research, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and the National Science Foundation. Um, we have a committee of 15 volunteer experts doing this work, um, and they're doing it by having four hybrid two-day meetings over the course of two years, plus monthly virtual meetings. Um, that's really to, to keep the uh, the report moving along and also to kind of, like I said, chip away at the information gathering. Um, we have open and public meetings. Um, so the open or public um, are open to anyone. And so with, with uh, Zoom these days, anyone can join. Um, if we are inviting anyone to speak to the committee, uh, if everyone could turn off their, um, if, mute yourselves if you're not talking, please. Um, I hear some background. Um, so the open and public, anytime someone joins us from outside the committee, it's open to the public. Um, and then we also have, one second. Um, so you could mute yourself if you're not talking. Um, we also have uh, closed meetings that are just the committee only, um, and that's just for deliberations and really um, discussing their conclusions and recommendations and where we're going with the report. Um, and then all of this leads to a report release um, to the public and to the sponsor in the summer of 2025. Um, next slide, please. Here's a, our statement of task. Uh, this is what the committee is working with. And these are the, um, the bullets here are everything that we have to address and nothing more in our report. Um, we'll put a link to our project website in the chat and you can read more of this, but um, just to quickly give you an overview, the, the 
committee is undertaking a study to identify evidence-based approaches for systemic change to increase racial, ethnic, and cultural diversity and inclusion in the Ocean Studies workforce. We're doing this by, collect, by um, collecting existing narratives, by analyzing policy strategies and practices of current um, and previously funded programs, um, both in ocean studies and in STEM in general. Um, we're developing uh, goals for a coordinated strategy across ocean studies um, that relate to each element of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, accessibility, and justice, and identification of metrics to evaluate progress. And again, uh, there's a lot of words here. We'll put the, the link in the chat. Um, next slide, please. Uh, here's a list of our wonderful, um, our 15 committee members. Um, Kiki Jenkins is our chair. Um, and bios are, are available on the project website. You can read more about them. Um, and many of them are here on the line today. Uh, next slide, please. And I briefly touched on this, but this is the project timeline. Um, everything in gray has already happened. Um, we've got two more um, full committee meetings. Those are those two-day meetings I talked about. And then we'll go to peer review in the spring of 2025 um, and release the report in summer of 2025. Uh, next slide, please. And to stay up to date, um, we encourage you to look at our website, um, enter in your email into that little box that you can probably hardly see on your screen, um, and you'll be sure to, to get updates um, via email on upcoming events, um, release of the report, and anything related to the study. Um, and, oh, and here's our agenda for today. I kind of already talked through this. So first up, um, we're joined by Lisa Hotelling and, um, and Gail uh, Scrocroft, sorry, Gail. Um, uh, they will be providing the briefing on ocean acoustics education and expertise. Um, I know that they've done this several times now. Uh, we really appreciate you being here. Um, so I want to go ahead and turn the floor over to you. I took a few too many minutes on that, but um, we'll catch up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kelly. And could we have our first slide, please? We'll get that in presenter view, please. While we're waiting for that first slide, I'll just say thank you very much. Uh, to the National Academies team for inviting us to uh, join you this afternoon. Um, <laughs> my name is Gail Scowcroft, and um, I will be presenting an overview of our National Academies Committee on Ocean Acoustics and Education Expertise report, along with my fellow committee member, Lisa Hotelling. Um, and so thank you for this opportunity, and it's nice to see so many of my friends and colleagues on this committee. Uh, we've all been working at this for quite a while now, and um, I really am, am happy to see that this work is being done and uh, wish you well with it. For the next... Oh, Gail, you're on mute all of a sudden. Hmm. Yeah, not there sure. was a hiccup there. Not sure what happened. Yeah, not sure what happened, um, but... Um, I'm, I'll repeat that for the next 20 minutes or so, Lisa and I will provide some of our reports, key findings, uh, particularly related to DEI, and then we'll hopefully have some time for questions. Uh, next slide, please. So to begin, um, a few take home messages from our report um, to set the stage for our, our report's findings. First of all, careers related to Ocean acoustics are vital for the national security, defense, economic, and environmental sectors. And I would say that's true for ocean science in general. Secondly, growth within these sectors requires a workforce with ocean acoustics related skills, ranging from technicians operating equipment on vessels to PhD researchers who are pushing the envelope um, of ocean acoustics. Finally, and no color. sorry about that. Uh, finally, an increased support for access, uh, support for and access to training and education opportunities is critical to meet the demands of this growing ocean acoustics workforce. Next slide, please. 
So this is our statement of task. Um, not expecting you to read all this right now, but um, it's the official statement of task from our sponsor, the U.S. Office of Naval Research. It was designed to access, assess the current and future state of ocean acoustics expertise. Um, and also uh, we had a lens, as you can see at the bottom there, of um, to trying to determine how to best prepare and recruit a diverse workforce um, looking into the future. Next slide. These are our committee members. Our committee was a bit smaller than yours. Um, it's comprised of eight experts assembled by the academies to address um, our statement of task. We our committee members represented diverse fields of ocean acoustics, um, bioacoustics, geophysics, oceanography, ocean engineering, signal processing, as well as education and workforce development. Next slide, please. So just a little bit um, about the study itself. We first began by reviewing previous literature. There were two seminal reports on ocean acoustics education that we looked at. Uh, we reviewed the recommendations from those reports and determined what was still relevant today. And then, um, and those, and that, all that information, of course, can all be found in the report and in some tables in the report. And then we commissioned the development, distribution, and analysis of a national online survey to gather information from academia, the workforce, both government and private sectors, and professional societies. And the results from this survey informed what our understanding of the current state of acoustic, acoustics, ocean acoustics education and expertise, as well as uh, future workforce needs. The full survey findings can be found in Appendix B of our report. Next slide, please. Um, regarding the state of ocean acoustics education and training, um, we examined examples of on-the-job training, workshops, short courses, and tutorials offered outside of the of typical degree programs um, offered at hot and higher ed institutions because uh, we felt that that was really important to get a good broad brush um, understanding of the field. And we concluded that learning opportunities to support the ocean acoustics workforce are increasing, but additional options and programs are critically needed to meet the demands of this growing workforce. Next slide, please. This graphic is maybe hard uh, to read in a, in a webinar or a, in a meeting like this, but we encourage you to look at this report because I think many of these careers apply to ocean science in general and may assist you as you're thinking about your report. Um, but this slide shows um, the gra a graphic that we developed displaying the broad diversity of careers within the ocean acoustics community, regardless of people's level of education. There are many entry points into ocean sciences and ocean acoustics specifically. And additionally, the military we felt the military career path um, is important, and it's a it's a an opportunity to entrain people into ocean acoustics that have had mostly on the job training. And so um, again, this may be helpful to you guys as you're thinking through um, career opportunities and ocean science in general. Okay, next slide. Regarding um, current and future employment, our committee found that a growing number of jobs related to ocean acoust acoustics do not require skills or competencies gained through the completion of a four-year higher education degree. Employers uh, told us that they often need workers who can operate acoustics equipment and participate in at-sea field work. Uh, and so we feel, felt that expanding on the job technical training opportunities was really critical moving into the future. Next slide, please. Um, so ocean acoustics is a highly interdisciplinary field. Um, as I mentioned, just 
and then the expertise represented by our committee members alone. Um, we had, I think, eight different disciplines uh, in the eight people that were they, that participated. And so um, this interdisciplinary field includes multiple STEM disciplines and faces a lot of challenges to recruitment and retention. Um, the, common to the STEM fields in general, but because of the unique nature of ocean acoustics, we had an additional challenge because there's an, of, an, a lack of awareness of the field itself and the different career paths that folks can take if they're interested in this kind of work. Uh, there's particularly a lack of awareness of ocean acoustics in K-12 education, as well as undergraduate education. So students, even if they're interested in ocean sciences in, at the undergrad level, may never um, be exposed at all to the ocean acoustics pathway. And so that is definitely a limit in diversifying the workforce. So now I'm going to turn it over to Liesl, um, who's going to share with you some of our findings um, on specifically on diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these can be mainly found in chapter five of our report. So Lisa, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Gail. And thank you. I want to echo Gail's um, thanks of inviting us for the, um, the opportunity to talk to you today about our report. So with respect to diversity, the committee relied on reviewing demographic information for the larger STEM field as a proxy for ocean acoustics because we found that the more granular data that's needed to incur that's um, needed is just really not there. And we need to make a better effort to collect that more granular data to get a more complete understanding of what's happening out there. The committee also addressed the concept of intersectionality and this is a graphic from the actual report. And uh, intersectionality largely contributes to the sense of belonging within a community and then reinforce the need for more granular data to again, get a better understanding. But the community should also not wait for additional demographic data to begin to take action and retrain, sorry, recruit and retain a more diverse workforce. Next slide, please. The committee did address several issues regarding uh, suppressing parity. And it is important to note that there can be differences between the sectors of employment, academia, government, industry, nonprofit, co uh, conservation, et cetera, with respect to the pernicious, pernicious impacts of some of the issues discussed in the report. However, these pervasive, pervasive issues were found across the board. That again, that whole sense of belonging issue, um, it's previous. Uh, it's a strong driver with respect to a person's choice to stay in a job or a field of study or even a career. Implicit and explicit cultural and in institutional constraints, which can include a variety of issues, including acceptance criteria, tenure criteria, cultural stereotypes, and caregiving, to just name a few issues that can really become an issue when it comes to stay for people to stay in different jobs. As a side note, uh, I'm not sure if the committee is aware, they probably are, that there was another NASM report supporting family caregivers in STEM that was released, and that's a really good resource if you're not familiar with that yet. And uh, as for other resources regarding the issue of underrepresentation, sp specifically in women in supervisory roles, which is another issue why people don't stay in the workforce, there are two books referenced in the report, and I just wanted to give them kind of a a quick plug here, the authority gap and the equity for women in science dismantling systematic barriers or uh, sorry, systemic barriers to the advancement. Uh, both of those are really interesting reads, really good books as resources. So next slide, please. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Those were supposed to magically appear while I was talking and I didn't let them know to let them magically appear, sorry. Um, one of our recommendations is recommendation 5.1 that really keys in on all of this that we've been discussing so far. So we really need to promote a sense of belonging for students, but then this can also apply for the workforce, not just students alone. We need to provide exposure to STEM role models and mentors as early and often as possible. And we also need to improve the workplace climate. No matter how good the workplace is, there's always something to improve. And then we know that some workplaces 
need a lot to improve. So it's out there. And uh, just to let you know, when you look at this, most of these recommendations, the committee, as we created a lot of our recommendations, there is an actor and an action, all part of these recommendations. So there's definitely what we are as a, a committee felt was a really important to stress, but then we also wanted to put some actors responsible for what could happen. Next slide, please. And then digging into this recommendation 5.1 a bit, the committee identified three areas which could be addressed to support the needs of the ocean acoustics workforce. And the first one was introducing students to the concept of ocean acoustics early in their K-12 education, just as Gail mentioned previously. Uh, ocean acoustics content is also largely absent from undergraduate programs. Um, I know I never saw it. Uh, experiential learning opportunities are critical for development and recruitment and retainment throughout uh, through professional development. So we need to make sure that these opportunities are often offered often and consistently for people to take advantage of. And this lack of support and routinely offered education training and outreach experiences will absolutely inhibit the growth of the ocean acoustics community over the next decade. Next slide, please. Um, the committee also discussed including the example of the ocean of COSI, the Centers for Ocean Science Excellence that Gail had mentioned before, as a national coordinated effort to raise the recognition of the field um, with trained scientists, educational professionals, and opportunities to incorporate acoustics information in an existing K-12 curriculum. So not exactly COSI, but a COSI-like model we thought would be really interesting and effective for this space. Next slide, please. Um, the diagram again. So the committee also felt it was important to highlight the range of careers and the pathways that are available tied to ocean acoustics to raise awareness in, of the field and helpfully help to recruit people for the field. Uh, for example, fields known to many undergraduate students such as climate scientists and biological science have obvious links to ocean acoustics through acoustics technologies for monitoring the environment. And often it's just never blatantly discussed as a potential career path. Next slide, please. Uh, the committee concluded that retaining the workforce amid the growth of ocean acoustics and the expansion of acoustics in other fields requires an increased training opportunities, both to help the current workforce keep pace with the R&D advancements, and then also provides opportunities for employees without technical backgrounds in ocean acoustics to uh, increase their skill sets. And next slide, please. Just a quick summary slide. We hope you take away from this report the importance of the field of ocean acoustics and actions needed to provide training and educational opportunities to meet the needs of a growing workforce. Significant efforts have been made in the past years, but there continues to be a real need for resources to ensure a diverse workshop um, has the education and training necessary to meet the future demands, especially related to the marine technology sector, which is a major growth of the blue economy and um, continued need for obviously our national defense and security needs. Next slide, please. Um, so now, of course, you're all champing at the bit to read more about this report. So if you, uh, you could probably see one of the links in the chat, and if not, that's the URL. So the report is available online. And the final slide, we thank you for your attention and welcome any questions. Wonderful. Thank you, Lisa and Gail. Um, we have roughly 10 minutes so for questions, if we have questions. Um, and I see the first one um, from Jean. Good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. So thank you very much for the presentation. And Gail, it's a delight to see you on the screen. I was very um, caught up, I guess, with the idea of what was suggested for the K-12 and the uh, need to build capacity. Uh, we have previously heard from the uh, National Ocean Science Bowl ourselves. And in looking at some of the programs, one of the things that came up that is sometimes those kinds of programs are restricted. They're very much enjoyed by places and schools and such where there is an awful lot of opportunity 
that sometimes the underserved are kind of missed on that because of funding and the teachers that are needed. Of course, with COSI, which if I'm a huge fan of, as Gail knows, and some of the members of this committee, one of the things that happens is funding comes and goes, which takes me then to the idea of the NOAA Teacher at Sea program, which has been in place and continues. So you talked about the alum website, or your report mentioned the alum website as an opportunity to share acoustics. So I kind of wonder with your report coming out so recently, what kind of contact might have been made? I'm thinking about when our report is over, when we have our recommendations and we have suggestions, you know, it's been around so long. Are there acoustic lessons that could have been handed to the alum page to be posted? Are you looking at acoustics being included as a topic in any of the future cruises? Were you talking about the teacher at sea actually creating materials that would go onto the website as far as acoustics? And I've kind of rounded a whole bunch of things in there. So, so my apologies, but I know our time is short and I have so many questions. Thank you in advance. Thank you, Jean. And it's, it's great to see you that on this committee, um, your expertise, I'm sure, is a great resource. Uh, so just quickly, I'll, I'll try to answer a couple of the questions that you posed. We just finished our report, so we have not really started our dissemination campaign. We're, well, we're in the process of it. Um, in fact, I'll be taking our um, uh, information about our report to a meeting in the Netherlands this coming week. Uh, but uh, there'll be a special issue of the Marine Technology Society Journal that Liesl is coordinating that will be focused on our report. And um, we hope to get the results of this report out far and wide um, as we work over the next few months. So that's that's the answer to the dissemination piece. Um, so we actually, we meaning the Discovery of Sound in the Sea project that I've been the PI on for um, about 23 years, in fact, I didn't say this at the beginning when I introduced myself, but I just retired a month ago from the University of Rhode Island's Graduate School of Oceanography, and Liesl is taking over as PI of the Dosage Project. So a um, little incestuous here, but um, long story short, uh, we have provided a lot of materials to the Teacher at Sea program over the years on underwater acoustics. And we also um, have a new teacher professional development program that DOSITS is running. Uh, it's a national program uh, so that we can uh, provide training for educators, not just in the content of ocean acoustics, but help them uh, integrate that content into their regular STEM coursework. Uh, so we are um, you know, hard at work trying to make sure that K-12 uh, gets exposed to this inf information and the particularly the career paths that um, that are available in that field. But I do think um, high school is far too late. This is my per personal opinion, not our report's opinion. But having been at this for years and years, I can say I think with uh, with expertise that high school is way too late to introduce students to ocean acoustics and ocean science in general. It has to be um, introduced much earlier. And um, the COSI model of having ocean scientists partner with informal science education institutions and large uh, school districts such that teachers are provided content, training, and encouragement to integrate ocean science into their classrooms is a really good model. It works. Did I answer all your questions, Jean? You did, Gail, and I, I really appreciate um, your last part about earlier being critical because the high school is much too late. We know we're losing 7,000 uh, middle school students, high school students every week in this country, unfortunately, has dropped and I do believe in, in reading the short section last night of your chapter five, 
it struck me knowing that you were on this committee that there was probably more discussion about the earlier with the idea of acoustics considering you know whale noises and all kinds of things that would just grab and excite the lower level student i would also wonder if there was any discussion with any of the robotic programs that are out there whether it was vax best first and such first this year is doing everything as far as dive and explore on um, the future of the oceans using it at lego league um first uh robotics and, and first tech challenge, but I wondered if any kind of discussion was in there about sensors and early use in, um, again, the middle school kinds of programs. Go ahead, Lisa. This is yeah. Lisa's world. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wish there was. No, there wasn't a large conversation on that. Uh, as you noted, the report is already very long, and we had to trim back a lot of our discussions into the work that you did see there. However, we did uh, do a current list of marine focused high schools around the country, and that is in one of the appendices. And we were hoping to also start to partner with high schools and lower grades on a lot of this content. But yes, I am all with you. I mean, we can put sensors in kindergarten now. Let's go for it. It's it's amazing what we could do and updating curriculum with some very cool tech. Hey, thank you. Um, there's a question from Kiki. Yes, um, thank you so much for your presentation. I want to piggyback a little bit off of Jean. Um, and I'm cognizant of the fact that everyone and their mother wants to cram more things into K through 12, and in this case, K through eight education. Um, and I'm cognizant of making a recommendation if we get to that point that's realistic. So, and I know I'm probably asking this pushing beyond what was in your study. So personal opinion, lived experience, your professional experience, how much is enough? Um, is it sufficient that during Shark Week, since it's on Discovery Channel, that they have that little week of time and maybe there's one lesson during their science hour. Is that sufficient for them to know, hey, this exists? Um, and how much of it, in your opinion, has to be ocean science versus versus ocean exposure? So they're out there engaging with, with the ocean, being inspired by the ocean, going out fishing, doing other things with it, but then also they are having science courses. It may not be ocean science, but later on they can build the bridge if they've had the exposure. How much do we actually need? Kiki, that is a fabulous question. And um, it is one that we have tried to answer um, over the years. And definitely one-shot deals do not work. We know that from research that was done at different COSI centers. So um, whether it's um, a one-day workshop for teachers, then expecting them to bring ocean science into their classroom, or whether it's a one-day science, you know, an hour-long visit from an ocean scientist, into their classroom or a one-shot visit to an aquarium or museum. Those experiences um, can introduce the topic, but unless there's sustained engagement, the needle doesn't move. And so in terms of how much is needed, um, we did find with um, a project that I was PI on, it's the Marine Technology for Teachers and Students project that it was really important to have sustained regular communication with classrooms of students and teachers over the course of an entire academic year to have touch points. So we had a monthly touch point that was very brief. And then we had quarterly science cafes where scientists went in and actually had an opportunity to, to speak with the students. So I think that, that worked. We had multiple students um, end up going to uh, um, an undergraduate school and majoring in STEM because of that project. So um, I do think, and this is lived personal experience, uh, not in our report, as you say, but um, it, it, one shot deals don't move the needle. And we know that from research. And I'm, I like the second part of your question too, because and I'm sitting here trying to rack my brain to remember this latest statistic that I read. 
But there is a large portion of people that are professional scientists, engineers, et cetera, in STEM fields right now, that it was not a school related spark that got them engaged in this, that it was some sort of after school program or some mentor or something. For me, I learned I was allergic to chlorine at age seven, and I took it upon myself to figure out the right pH balance for a swimming pool that I could continue to swim in. So I started water chemistry when I didn't even know that that's what I was doing. And that's what drove me. I mean, and there's so many stories like that out there that um, the schooling did help because then I could go and get reinforcements and better learning. But it was that inner spark that came from not school. Uh, which I think is really important to be a touch point. And then I wanted to circle back to the school part too, because that's not necessarily just on the students, right? It's also on the teachers. And we know from research that teachers need to see and teach things at least three times before they become very comfortable with incorporating it into the regular curriculum. So we also need to make sure that we're giving, just as Gail mentioned with the MATS program, we need to make sure that we're giving all teachers the time and space and comfort level to be able to assimilate this information and integrate it into their classrooms so they can be using traditional curriculum but putting an ocean twist on it so traditional examples and word problems etc but just putting an ocean twist on it and that's another way to easily expose students to the ocean when they might not have that exposure and, and I know that we're running short of time. And so um, I did want to offer a couple of things for you, you guys to consider when you're doing your more in, further information gathering. And this is regarding an, uh, recruiting and retaining students from diverse backgrounds into ocean science careers, particularly getting them into either undergraduate programs or graduate school. We, we've learned over the years that if you don't engage the families of um, Black students and Hispanic students in the process of um, recruitment, you're not going to get those students. It's very different than predominantly white students. And families need to know what you're going to do with their children, um, How? what are the career choices that are available to them and what are the salary ranges, parents need to know. So if you're recruiting into a graduate degree program, for example, the parents should be invited to the campus along with the students. And that's something that doesn't happen. I think that could really move the needle if that those kinds of processes were um, added to the application process. And also, another quick bit, we also included the guidance counselors too, because yes. they're so often left out of the equation. Yes, exactly, Liesl. Also, um, minority students don't like to move far away from home because their parents don't want them to. There's a lot of pressure on them not to. And so an expectation that a student is going to move across the country to go to undergraduate school or, graduate or, or enter a graduate program is relatively unrealistic. And finally, it's really, we found in the information gathering that we did for our report that technician opportunities are critical to moving the needle in diversity because those technician opportunities are often a gateway to an ocean science career. So that's something, um, those points, if you guys can explore those a bit as you're working on your report, I think you'll find that that is, that those suggestions are helpful. Thank you so much, Gail, and thank you, Liesl. Um, really appreciate you taking the time to be with us. Um, those were fantastic questions. Appreciate those as well. And I think we could probably keep going, but we do have to move on. Um, you're welcome to stay on um, and, you know, whatever, whatever suits you. Um, so, Moving on, um, we have Jasmine Graham joining us. Um, she is the CEO and President of Minorities in Shark Science. Um, and thank you, Jasmine, for, for taking time out of your day. She's in the middle of a, a book signing tour and still offered to, um, to meet with us. So thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, so the, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Um, so I don't have any slides, so you're just gonna listen to me talk. I didn't know where I was going to be or if I was going to have a laptop. So I did not commit to slides. Um, um, 
like was mentioned, my name is Jasmine. Um, I am the president and CEO of Minorities in Shark Sciences, which we affectionately refer to as MISS. Our organization is focused on supporting gender minorities of color and from the global south to get involved in marine science and marine conservation, particularly um, in the field of shark and ray research and conservation. And um, we do that in a number of ways. So we serve uh, what we say K to gray. Uh, so someone mentioned start early, start often. We definitely believe in that. Um, so for our elementary school um, programs, we have Science at the Sea days. And those are days where we bring community members, community groups, and um, school groups out to the ocean to explore. Um, we do things like kayak. Um, we get them comfortable with sticking their faces in the water with a mask and snorkel. Um, so a lot of the, the students that we work with, they don't know how to swim. Um, and so we, we get them used to being in and around water, um, hopefully encouraging them to then, uh, pursue options to learn how to swim. Uh, we also do seine netting. Um, we teach, uh, fishing techniques. Uh, we do a lot of work with microscopes and looking at plankton. We really try to touch on a lot of the content and curriculum of the standards that they're learning in school to sort of supplement um, in a hands-on and engaging way. And um, we have for our middle schoolers, we have camps. So we have day camps starting for our middle school students. Uh, we do spring break camp as well as summer camp. And this is a week long opportunity for kids to come out and get to explore and do science. And by do science, I mean asking questions that they're interested in and trying to figure out the answers. So we spend the first couple of days of the camp giving them a sort of rundown of the tools that scientists often use to study um, the coastal ecosystems. And then we let them sort of brainstorm what they're interested in and follow that train of thought and carry it out as a small uh, research project. Sometimes they go on to present that at science fair which is always really exciting. Um, sometimes they'll go and have uh, little community share outs. Uh, so it kind of just depends on the group. Uh, but we're really interested in letting them do science um, and showing them that science is not just worksheets and boring class assignments, because a lot of them come and they say, well, I don't like science, um, and, or I'm not good at science, or I'm not smart enough. And so what we really want to do is spend the week proving to them that they can do science um, and that science can be fun, especially when you get to follow your own curiosity, um, which is naturally built in to us as human beings. Uh, we do a similar program for our high schoolers, except for the high school summer camp is actually a sleepaway camp. So they get to come with us to a island, an uninhabited island in the middle of a wildlife uh, refuge in Florida. And um, they eat, sleep, and breathe ocean sciences for a week. And it's really great. Uh, because it's very rustic field experience uh, where they don't have access to their their uh, internet in the same way that they're used to. And um, so it's a, it's a bit of a shock at first and then dive in. Um, and so it's really fun to see. And on that summer camp, we actually take them shark tagging. Um, so they get to interact with sharks, uh, many of them for the first time, certainly the first time where they physically get to touch a shark. Um, and that's always a really fun and exciting experience. Um, so those are all of our K through 12 programs. Uh, we also have a program that we call Guild Guardians, where we create content for educators and um, students on their own to be able to explore the all of the really fun things about sharks and rays and we also train teachers to be able to deliver 
um, our curriculum in their classrooms and use sharks as a gateway to talk about other subjects. Uh, because whenever you put things in the context of sharks, it's amazing how much more interesting it gets. Um, so we we do have those um, professional development options for our educators. Uh, we refer to them as Gill Guardians Ambassadors, um, and we train both formal and informal educators. Um, then for our young people, young adults, college students, as well as folks that are non-traditional students or people that are looking to make a career change, we have a lot of professional development opportunities for them as well. So we have our three-day workshops, which are all about learning field techniques and getting to connect with people who are working in the field, getting to connect with other people in your same um, career journey. And those are really fun. And one of the reasons why we have those three-day workshops is because it's often really hard for people to get field experience. Um, a lot of things in marine science, as y'all probably know, are pay to play or they expect you to work for free. And that's just not realistic for a lot of folks. It's also not realistic for a lot of folks to take a month, two months, three months out of their lives um, to go do an internship, especially if they don't know that this is the path that they want to pursue. And so the three-day experience is a lot more flexible. We do it on a weekend. Um, so the time commitment is much more limited. And it's a great opportunity to just try field research um, and see how they like it. A program called Diversifying Ocean Sciences, which is a year-long hybrid program. So again, we're trying to do the hybrid because we know that opportunities are sometimes inaccessible for people who can't take their current jobs or their family obligations, things like that. So we give them the opportunity to do this hybrid experience where for the first five months, it's all background knowledge, building that information, getting to know the people in their cohort and their mentors. And then in the summer, they have a week to two weeks of hands-on experience with their mentors at one of our partner institutions to learn the techniques that they have been building the foundation for um, so they can really dive right in, pun intended, to uh, what they're doing. And then after that, they have the opportunity to build on their experience to create a deliverable. And we have this deliverable De deliverable be very vague in its sort of expectation. Um, so we have folks that are really interested in the sort of research side. And so they will go on and use data that they collected during that um, intensive experience to build out a, a project, which they present at our MISS Summit at the end of the year. Um, some of them go the more creative route. They're interested in either science education or in art to communicate science and things like that. Um, so we've had people make scenes. We've had people do videos, mini documentaries, uh, things like that. And then uh, we also have people that go more of the social science route um, and they kind of look at the experience itself uh, and how it shaped their colleagues. Uh, so that's a really cool program that we have. Um, and oh, I should mention that all of our programs are free and we cover uh, travel, lodging, and, and we do stipends um, if there is any sort of lost wage that is going to happen. Um, so any of our programs where they are missing work, uh, we compensate them uh, with a stipend. And then we also have internships and fellowships so people can intern with us as an organization. People can also... Um, do fellowships with our partner institutions and um, be supported by MISS as they do those uh, programs. Uh, 
have um, opportunities for folks to intern with us either for a semester or a whole year. We take interns in every aspect of our organization. So folks who are interested in education, um, we have them participate in our education programs. Uh, folks that are interested in science communication, we have them um, build our Guild Guardians curriculum or help with our social media outreach. And then we even have um, our art side. So we have scientific illustrators that do all of our scientific illustrations um, and folks that do videos that are interested in filmmaking. This past summer, we even had an intern that is an MFA student for theater, and she is working on a musical uh, about sharks. So um, lots of really cool stuff and opportunities for uh, people to get involved and learn. And then we also have our research arm. So once people are in the field of science, observation with them in order to support their research, particularly those from institutions where there's not a lot of funding or infrastructure and our members from the Global South as well. We have our Iconic Oceans Program, which stands for Integrated, Coordinated, Open, Networked, and Inclusive Conservation. And um, we support them with small grants, um, funding to attend conferences. We serve as a connector between people who are doing similar projects and people who need the resources like a genetics lab or a stable isotopes lab, and they don't have that at that or their institution. We partner them with other members uh, to be able to work on collaborative projects. Uh, we have a thematic set uh, of special issues in 2025 that will highlight a lot of this work. We also have a book, Minorities in Shark Sciences, Diverse Voices in Shark Research, where uh, a lot of our members' research is published. And so we're really focused on helping people throughout their career um, along the full pathway um, to doing um, marine science and conservation. Uh, we have about 500 members representing 34 different countries and about 37 U.S. states and territories. Uh, and we were founded in June of 2020. So we have been in existence for four years, but it's been a very busy and exciting four years. And that's my spiel. And I'll take questions, I think. Questions. <laughs> Wow, Jasmine, <laughs> that is incredible. <laughs> I see some uh, kudos um, emojis in the <laughs> in the chat here. Um, that is just so incredible. Thank you for sharing all of that, and thank you for doing all that work. Um, I am certain that there are some questions among the committee members. Um, if you guys have a question, just raise your hand. Um, and in the meantime, um, I'll ask one in the chat here. So what is the length of time for the formal informal educator sessions you mentioned? And are there different sessions for elementary, middle, or high school teachers? Yes, so our, our um, training is about an hour and a half uh, for the basics. And then we also have some, some educators that want a little bit more in depth. And so they actually will come out with us for a day on the boat uh, to see what we do so that they can translate that um, into their curriculum for their learners. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's about an hour and a half uh, for just baseline what's going on. Uh, but we do have a further opportunities if people want to really hone in on uh, what's going on with the sharks and the marine research. All right, thank you. Um, and Javier has a question that actually I had as well. <laughs> I'll just ask it. Um, where does the funding come from? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so <laughs> about 30% of our funding is from our individual donors. Uh, our average donation size is $50, uh, so we're a very grassroots organization. Um, another 40% comes from mostly from um, private foundations uh, and community foundations. And then uh, we also have a NSF grant in collaboration with another organization. Um, so we have some federal money as well. And then about 5% is corporate sponsorships 
mostly from zoos and aquariums. All right, thank you. Um, oh, and can you share what your average budget, your annual budget is? Uh, yes, our annual budget is about $550,000 a year. Amazing <laughs> to do all that. Um, truly impressive. Um, are there, so I think those are the questions from the chat. Um, does anyone else have any questions? We have just a couple more minutes, um, if you do. I think you just thoroughly wowed us all. <laughs> Um, while we wait for if anybody has any last questions, um, I think that you mentioned that there is a report coming out in 2025 that has some data. Um, I know it's you're four years old now, um, but is there a place that we can find some statistics? Um, yeah. Yes, so on our website, we have our impact report from our first um, three years and um, that impact report is is uh, really scratching the surface. We're doing a more in-depth evaluation of all of our programs and the impact um, with interviews and surveys of people who have participated and of our members. Um, but that impact report gives a really good overview um, at a bird's eye view. Uh, so I would recommend checking that out. That is on our website. And um, we kind of took a, a snippet of what we were working on. Uh, but yes, our full evaluation of the first four years of our programming will be coming out in 2025. Awesome, we'll be looking for that. Um, okay, so we have two more minutes. A last call for any hands. And I don't know if you can see the chat, but there's a lot of thank yous, as well as some wells. Um, all right. Um, well, thank you again for taking time out of your day to join us. And especially, I know it wasn't easy to do that today, um, but um, this was really informative for the committee. Um, and I see Gail and, and Lisa there. Thank you so much. Um, this was a fantastic hour. Um, I think we've learned quite a bit. And um, I hope you don't mind if we reach out with a question if anything comes up um, in the in the later conversations. Um, but with that, I'd like, on behalf of the committee, thank you all for joining us. Um, we appreciate everything that you give to prepare and to be here. And um, oh, and Jasmine's uh, email is in the chat. Excellent. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, okay, so thanks so much, and have a great uh, rest of your week.